Our text today is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. I will read them now. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and at all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they were not. When Herod was dead, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Unlike the prophecy that follows, there is no confusion at all about which Old Testament prophecy is being fulfilled in the first part of this reading. It is Jeremiah 31, verse 15. Why this prophecy takes place now, why here, and what the prophecy means, is a bit more elusive. I think it's important, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. After Jacob's encounter with the angel of the Lord, his name was changed to Israel. From then on, alternatively, and for a number of reasons which we really should not take time to go into now, he is variously referred to as either Jacob or Israel in the rest of Genesis. He is told in the first verse of Genesis 35 to go to Bethel. But God had also told him to go to his father. It would seem reasonable then that Israel was only to dwell at Bethel for the time it took him to accomplish the business of making an altar to God and getting his life and thinking and that of his people straightened around. Then he moves on toward Beersheba. What follows is admittedly a bit obscure as to details. We'll try to pin it down without being too inflexible on controversial points, of which there are a few. As they traveled south, they were a short distance from a place called Ephrath. This place is later identified as Bethlehem. It would seem from the language that they had not yet quite reached Ephrath. Let me briefly state the story, and then we'll look at some of the meanings. Israel and his people were journeying south toward Beersheba. Just before they reached Ephrath, which means the place of fruitfulness and blessing, Rachel went into labor, and the place is called Bethlehem in verse 19. The labor was very difficult, and Rachel feared that she wasn't going to be able to give birth to this son, but the midwife assured her that she would give birth to a healthy baby. Now, this indeed proved to be the case, but as a result of the birth, Rachel died. Prior to her death, Rachel called this male son Benoni, which means the son of my sorrow. After her death, Israel named him Benjamin, which means the son of the right hand. Jacob set up a pillar of stones at her grave, there at the site, which would later become Bethlehem. A few facts not specifically mentioned in this story should also be reviewed here. This was the first and the only son born to Israel after his conversion. Benjamin was the first and only son born to Israel after his ability to sire children had been altered by God in his wrestling with the angel. Benjamin was the first and only son born in the promised land. All others were born in Mesopotamia. Rachel was one of 
two of the patriarchs and their wives not buried in the cave in the field of Machpelah. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and eventually Joseph were all buried there. The others not buried there was Rebekah, who had left Isaac in his blind old age at Mamre and gone to live with Jacob. She was buried under an oak at Bethel. The oak tree implies that it was a pagan burial after the manner of the Mesopotamians, and this was at least a testimony of the Old Covenant and the works of the flesh. There are some other reasons, too, why she was not buried in the cave with the patriarchs, but we digress. But in the case of Rachel, it is a New Testament testimony all the way. Israel is in contrast to Jacob. The natural ability to engender children is contrasted to the siring of a child after his capacity to bear had been taken away by God in chapter 33 and verse 25. It bears testimony to the fact that the Messiah was sired miraculously by the Holy Ghost and that he was not a son of Adam. The fact that Benjamin was born in the promised land makes this a spiritual, not a natural birth in prophetic type and a matter of the new, not the old covenant. The fact that Rachel died in childbirth bears witness to the death of Christ and the travail of his soul, as Isaiah puts it in chapter 53, verse 11. That would be necessary in order to accomplish for us redemption, the new birth, and life in the new creation and kingdom of God. Rachel called her son Benoni. According to the flesh, Christ was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, in Isaiah 53, 3. But Israel called him the son of the right hand. According to the Spirit, it was a most joyous thing that resulted in his exaltation and enthronement at the right hand of God, according to Acts 2, 25-34, 531, 755, Romans 8, 34, Colossians 3, 1, Hebrews 1, 3, 8, 1, 10, 12, 12, 2, 1 Peter 3, 22, Acts 2, 28, and Hebrews 12, 2. The birth took place in Bethlehem as a testimony that the Messiah would be born there, and she died there, which foretold that it would be the death of the old and the birth of the new. All of those things were prophetic testimonies of the passing of the national, natural, flesh and blood covenant and the coming in of the new, eternal, heavenly covenant. It was another of the ways that the Old Testament constantly held before us, in analogy, metaphor, and prophetic testimony, the primacy and superiority of the covenant of promise made with Abraham in Genesis 12, which predated the Old Covenant by 430 years, according to Galatians 3.17, and was confirmed in Christ long before Sinai and the start of the Old Covenant, according to verse 16 of that same passage. Genesis, and the whole Old Testament for that matter, is filled with these prophetic contrasts between the covenant of promise and the covenant of law and the superiority and primacy of promise over law. In this instance, all of the testimony is in type and analogy. What I mean to say is that Benjamin was not actually the representative of the covenant of promise. That distinction belonged to Joseph, as Genesis 49 reveals. But the circumstances surrounding his birth were such to make this an ideal testimony of the coming covenant of promise. This is an often used literary device in the Old Testament. Solomon, for example, was not superior to David. Yet in the contrast, established at the building of the temple where David was denounced as a man of war and the assignment was given to Solomon, the man of peace, Solomon was set above David as a testimony of Christ, the Prince of Peace, of which the temple, even though it was not ordered by God to be built, was a testimony. Still, In the majority of cases, Solomon was a poor second to David in every way, and it was David from whose house Christ was raised up according to the flesh. So it is here with Benjamin. He was a poor second to Joseph as a son of Rachel and a representative of the spiritual seed. 
In Genesis 49, Joseph is giving a blessing far above Judah or any of the sons of Israel, while Benjamin's blessing is common at best, and Israel's evaluation of him in Genesis 49 was not the highest in tone. But there were things about Benjamin, not true of Joseph, which made him an ideal analogy in this instance. Joseph was born to Jacob in Mesopotamia, before God altered his ability to bear children. Since after his conversion he would sire no more sons in a strange land, it was a good and vivid testimony of conversion and the superiority of having spiritual children over having natural ones. But the greater testimony was the superiority of the children of new creation and of spiritual birth over the children of the flesh and the nation and that the time would come when there would be no more interest in or giving life to the children of the flesh and the nation by God. And then Rachel did not die giving birth to Joseph as she had to Benjamin. And so these testimonies are best put forth in this instance in the child Benjamin and the events surrounding his birth. This is not to suggest that there was no lasting significance to Benjamin's being a son of Rachel and Israel, born in the promised land, the second instead of the firstborn to Rachel and Israel, and his testimony of the nations or the Gentiles rather than the nation. In fact, there was a lasting testimony and more than a testimony in God's recognition of the fathers and in the sending of the gospel to the Jews, first as a tribute to them, one would want to remember that it was Paul, the Benjamite, who was selected to take the gospel to the nations or the Gentiles. But the weight of the testimony of the new covenant and its primacy and superiority over the old covenant is borne along in contrast between Joseph and the rest of his brethren and culminates in Genesis 49. In Matthew 2, Herod slew all the male children two years and below in Bethlehem and in all the coasts. In verse 18, Ramah is mentioned along with Rachel, which is a direct reference to Bethlehem and perhaps to the camp of Israel at the time of her death in this childbirth. Rachel is therefore identified with Bethlehem in the area. It's not uncommon for the Old Testament writers to identify an area by the name of a person associated with it, such as Israel, David, Ephraim, and so on. In this passage, Bethlehem is identified as Rachel because of the redemptive history involved, not only for the eventual program to the world at large, but for Israel during the earthly ministry of Christ to that nation. The Messiah whom they would reject and kill, would come to deliver them from the bondage of sin and disobedience to God, and he would come from the city of David. This was also the city of Rachel, who died and was buried there for having given birth to the allegorical coming delivered. Some men see modern Ramallah as ancient Ramah. Well, that's possible but not very likely in my view, for Ramallah is a good ways north of Jerusalem and not on the coast of the Dead Sea. There is no indication in Matthew 2 that even Jerusalem is involved, which is significantly closer to Bethlehem than Ramallah and interposed between the two. I do not personally know how to precisely locate ancient Ramah, but the language seems to indicate the area on the seacoast from Bethlehem south, that would be the seacoast of the Dead Sea. This would perhaps include Hebron, whatever else, I am not quite sure. But the geography, which is certainly important as history, is not the most significant thing here. It is the fulfillment of the prophecy which is significant. So what was this all about? Why did God decree this event to happen here at this time? The story is taken from Jeremiah 31, that great chapter on the New Covenant, and is in some ways out of place here. Everything is so positive there, and it's inserted in a single verse after which the positive note returns for the rest, or at least most of the rest, of the chapter. 
I'm not going to try to get too profound and too exhaustive here. I have done that in my second commentary on the book of Genesis called The Old Man and the River, but it would take too much time to develop, and it would take us too far from the storyline of the Gospels. I offer here a brief discussion as an entry into that study, if you want to pursue it. The establishment of the new covenant of promise with Christ as king is going to mean great judgment and agony to the nation of Israel. Remember that in Galatians 3 and 4, these two covenants are opposites, they are antagonists, and they cannot coexist. Hebrews 10 tells us one had to be taken away before the other could be established. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32, God says that the new covenant will not be like the covenant made with the nation at Sinai. Hundreds of prophecies have been made in the Old Testament about the vengeance that would be poured out by God on the nation when that change came. The fact that Christian Zionism cannot or will not understand those prophecies changes nothing with God or the doctrine of the historic church for that matter. It was the disobedience and unbelief of Israel all through the Old Testament era which climaxed in the murder of the Lord of glory and the voiding of the Old Covenant that made the New Covenant necessary from the perspective of time and history. God had slain the firstborn of Egypt in order to deliver Israel from the bondage of Egypt, but Israel had turned against him, ignored his laws, profaned his sanctuary, and worshipped and served other gods. The death of Israel's firstborn in Bethlehem, where the Christ was born, was an act of vengeance from God. Man is sometimes the messenger of vengeance, but he is never the one who has the right to originate it. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Herod is not to be excused in any way for this brutal and inhumane action. Even so, Jeremiah 31.15 makes it clear that this was from the hand of God. That which is brutal and inhumane when one man commits it against another is not so when God the righteous judge exacts it as a punishment and a judgment that Israel had 900 years to avoid by repentance. Still today, Judaism is unrepentant for the crucifixion of Christ which they deny in the face of history and clear biblical declaration. Christian Zionism, like the fools they are, are trying to acquit Judaism for the most abominable of all acts, the one that resulted in the desolation of their house, the kingdom being taken from them, the old covenant being voided, and the nation being cut off forever as the people of God. It was fitting that this time of vengeance should have begun as a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy at the very outset of the incarnation of God in the person of Christ. It was at the place of his birth and at the place of one of the most profound and prospective prophetic events in Israel's long history, the priests. The prophets, the lawyers, the scribes, and the people should have been gathered there in great adoration, admiration, and joy. They knew about this prophesied event. The Jewish leaders told Herod where Christ would be born. Anna and Simeon knew, and they were there. Where were the rest of them? But they were not there because the Jewish leadership and the people in general were indifferent to this event. Verse 3 makes that clear. The Roman bondage was not as restrictive as Egypt or Babylon, and Herod had began leaning their way in order to try to gain favor with the people. There was no outcry for the Messiah to come, and when it was noised about that he had come, they were troubled. In fact, they were more than indifferent. They were hostile. If Herod had only known, he would not have had to put himself to the trouble to try to kill the Christ. The Jews would have taken care of that for him. They would come to hate Jesus worse than Herod and for more condemning reasons. So we have the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, but this passage contains another, and it is unique in that it does not repeat an Old Testament scripture in literary form. 
This has caused some commentators to speculate that the scripture being fulfilled is not in the Bible, and it was lost or excluded somewhere along the line. Now, this is not the case, as I hope to point out. Like the previous one, it is a bit elusive, but it is, in fact, at least in my view, the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did more grievously afflict her by way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that have walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, Zebulun and Naphtali were assigned their inheritance and their future in Galilee of the nations. Naphtali was given the area from Nazareth east, and Zebulun was assigned the area from Nazareth west to the sea coast. In these verses, the prophecy calls for the light to rise from Zebulun and Naphtali. The great light, as we have seen in the Gospel of John earlier, is a prophetic reference to Christ and his coming. Since Zebulun and Naphtali occupied different areas, the prophecy is pretty obviously referring to a place that is common to both of them, and that place is Nazareth. For the knowledgeable Israelite, it didn't take long to figure out that this was what Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 was saying, that Christ would come from Nazareth, and that he would therefore be known in Judah, or Judea, as a Nazarene. Those Jewish leaders who called him a Nazarene and questioned whether any good thing could come out of Nazareth knew full well that he had been born in Bethlehem of Judea, an offspring of David, but they did not want him, and they were glad to have him be known as a Nazarene so they could be critical of him and deny his claims. This prophecy is important for two reasons other than just the fulfillment. It shows that he was rejected by the Jews at his very birth, and it shows that not only would he go to the Gentiles, but in the program of God from before the world began, he was sent to the whole world, here testified to as Galilee of the nations. As Galatians chapter 3 tells us, his program to the nation of Israel was just a parenthetical operation that was part of a school teaching ministry to bring us to Christ, and it was temporary from the outset. Next week, if the Lord wills, we shall take our first look at St. Mark's Gospel in this Harmony of the Gospels, along with others, for they all tell the story of his presentation to the nation of the King and the Kingdom. This is a very important development in the study of the Gospels, and we will spend a good bit of time with it. It holds one of the major keys to the understanding of the Gospels and the earthly ministry of Jesus the Christ. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.